Good morning and welcome to the session on traditional value assessment methods exacerbating health inequities, a sickle cell disease case study. I'm Latasha Lee, Vice President of Clinical and Social Research and Development for the National Minority Quality Forum. And today I will serve as the moderator for this session. Before introducing our really um, amazing panelists, I wanna give you a bit of background on some of the work that the NMQF has done on uh, sickle cell disease. So as our president and CEO, Dr. Gary Puckran always shares, the National Minority Quality Forum is in the, in the business of big data. So the forum has a comprehensive uh, database of over 5 billion patient records. One of the diseases that we really have focused on in the recent years is sickle cell disease. And this image shows some of the um, uh, what we call health uh, indices around sickle cell disease. So on the left, you're seeing Medicare fee-for-service data, and on the right, Medicaid. As you can see, there's particular er there are particular areas within our, within our nation where you see um, red or dark spots, and that's where you see large populations of individuals living with sickle cell disease. And I lastly want to share this publication as we begin to discuss today some of the disparities that res, um, have resulted in uh, issues with access to care, issues with tr um, treatment, and a number of inequities related to sickle cell disease as we begin our discussion today. So with that, I'm going to welcome our uh, illustrious panelists. So we're going to start things off with uh, Sarah Van Trugen. Um, she is the Executive Director for the Partnership to Improve Patient Care, which is an organization focused on the promotion of patient-centered health system, um, a patient-centered health system that achieves value to the patient by meaningfully engaging patients and people with disabilities in the conduct of comparative effectiveness research, the assessment of treatment value through shared decision and development and implementation of evaluation and alternative payment methods. She is a healthcare and welfare um, policy export for Thorn Run Partners, and she began her career on Capitol Hill, working for the former Senator John Burrow from Louisiana. At Thorn Run, she has represented a number of clients, including hospital systems, pharmaceutical companies, healthcare provider associations, and coalitions. And in 2009, she successfully represented the Louisiana Coalition of Healthcare Providers seeking to avoid a dramatic reduction in Medicaid payments after Hurricanes Katrina and Rita as part of a new health reform law. She is deeply devoted to the care of underserved individuals and has been involved in efforts to reauthorize um, TANF, which is the Temporary Assistance for Needy Families law during her tenure on Capitol Hill. She continues to work on issues related to health and welfare of low-income families and children. And she's received her bachelor's degree from Wake Forest University and her Juris Doctorate from Catholic um, University Columbus School of Law. Our next panelist is Dr. Alexis Thompson, a true friend, who is currently the hematology section head at the Ann and Robert H. Lurie Children's Hospital of Chicago in Chicago, Illinois. She holds the A. Watson and Sarah Armour Endowed Chair for Blood Diseases and Cancer at Lurie Children's Hospital. She is a professor of pediatrics at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. And in her current position, she is an investigator on a, multi, on a number of multi-center trials as well as her own institutional clinical studies. Her most significant scientific contributions are clinical and translational studies to better understand the treatment of hemoglobinopathies like sickle cell disease. She has been a leader in multi-center collaborations such as the NHLBI, which is the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute funded Thalassemia Clinical Research Network and the Sickle Cell Disease Implementation Consortium. Dr. Thompson is also the Associate Director for Equity and Minority Health at the Robert H. Lurie Cancer Center at Northwestern. She has served as regional and national um, advisory on regional and national advisory committees for governmental agencies, as well as nonprofit organizations focused on improving healthcare access. She was also the past president in 2018 of the American Society of Hematology, my former employer. Next is Dr. Irene Agadoa, 
She is Vice President of Medical Affairs and Team Leader at Global Blood Therapeutics, or GBT. GBT is a biopharma company whose goal is to transform the treatment of sickle cell disease, an overlooked rare condition which we'll focus on in our discussion today, and help address the urgent needs of this community. GBT's medicine, Voxolator, brand name Oxybrita, is one of only four approved drugs for the treatment of sickle cell disease by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. She has worked in biopharma for nearly a decade, and she is trained as an internist, earning her MD from The Ohio State University College of Medicine. Last but not least is my friend, Dr. Lakia Bailey, Executive Director of the Sickle Cell Community Consortium, or SC3. Lakia is a sickle cell disease advocate, educator, and research scientist. Diagnosed with sickle cell disease at age three, she is a passionate advocate for those living with this rare disease and committed to the voice of encouragement and empowerment within the sickle cell community. Despite the devastating symptoms of sickle cell disease, Dr. Bailey was determined to complete her educational goals, earning a bachelor's degree in biochemistry and molecular biology in 2001 and a doctorate in molecular hematology and regenerative medicine in 2012. During her coursework, she was named the Southern Regional Board Doctoral Scholar and was the recipient of numerous awards and honors, including the Fisher Scientific Award for Excellence in Biomedical Research, the Medical College of Georgia Alumni Association Award, the Georgia Regents University Leadership Award, and inducted into Alpha Epsilon Phi Honor Society. At the completion of her doctorate, she founded SC3, a coordinated network of sickle cell community-based organizations, patient and caregiver advocates, community partners, healthcare and health research advisors. The consortium functions as an organization um, who allows this diverse community of stakeholders to identify, prioritize, develop, and execute solutions for patient identified needs and gaps within the sickle cell community. Dr. Bailey has served as a consultant and expert for various biopharma companies and sits on the research advisory board for the Foundation for Sickle Cell Disease Research and on the executive committee for the National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute's Cure Sickle Cell Disease Initiative. Sarah will start off our discussion today to help level set those in our audience not familiar with value assessments and qualities. And then she will be followed by Dr. Alexis Thompson, who will provide an overview of sickle cell disease, which will be the case study for our discussion this morning. Following Alexis's conversation, we will have Dr. Agadoa then share a number of challenges with value assessments for this devastating disease, highlighting the disparities associated with sickle cell disease care and treatment. And then we will round off the discussion with Dr. Bailey, who will provide the most important perspective, which is that of individuals living with sickle cell disease. With that, I'm gonna turn things over to Sarah. Great, thank you so much. I really, I can't tell you how much I appreciate um, the ability to be here and introduce myself and the partnership to improve patient care. Um, here, let's see, there it goes. Um, so I'm gonna quickly move to the next slide because I know we have limited time. Um, so the Partnership to Improve Patient Care um, was established in 2008 as a coalition of organizations that represent patients and people with disabilities, providers, researchers, innovators. Um, what brought us together originally was the hot debate that was happening on Capitol Hill around comparative effectiveness research. Um, we strongly supported PCORI and its reauthorization. Our chairman, Tony Coelho, as some of you may remember, was the original author of the Americans with Disabilities Act and is also a patient with epilepsy. So he really came to that discussion with a very patient-centered view of how research was um, not necessarily capturing the questions that really matter to patients when they were making decisions. Um, and included in the PCORI statute, which is what we're really gonna be talking a lot about today, um, was a ban on the use of qualities in Medicare. And so since we, um, you know, since Bacori's creation, that issue has actually taken a bit of a front seat. Um, and so we're gonna be, I'm gonna, my hope is to kind of provide the, the level set for this conversation in terms of describing what that means. So on this slide, it says, what are you worth? And so the quality adjusted life year is a number which theoretically 
represents the degree to, uh, to which a drug or treatment extends and improves quality of life. Um, the quality will assign a value to a human's life on a scale between one and zero, zero being dead, one being perfect health. As you can see on this slide, that doesn't always play out because you also can have states worse than death, which is the, the number below a zero, um, where academics will say, well, this is, a, this is a condition in which people would not want to live. A lot of times people with those conditions would argue otherwise. Um, so the value assessment will say, if you're here at a 0.5, um, what is the incremental then improvement in your quality of life that then, um, and that is the basis for then a cost effectiveness assessment. So you may go from a 0.5 to a 0.7, but you will be disadvantaged if you're starting from that 0.5 or that 0.7. Um, and if you are not someone who will get to a one, so a person who is living with a disability or living with a chronic disease is less likely to achieve that one. They're more likely to achieve a very small incremental improvement in their health with treatment, um, which then disadvantages them in the context of how we value treatments. So the good news is that we actually have a long history in this country of not using qualies. Um, historically, we have, we, in 2010, actually, if you look at the, the statute that created PCORI, um, that was part of the Affordable Care Act, it explicitly stated um, that Medicare, that said the secretary under Medicare was not allowed to use qualies to determine coverage, reimbursement, and incentive programs in Medicare. Um, and we would argue that when the Affordable Care Act, or if the Affordable Care Act does come up for debate, that we actually should probably be considering how we can strengthen this protection. And it's interesting because this debate actually didn't start in 2010. Um, a lot of people don't realize that the disability community was deeply engaged in advocacy against the use of qualies as far back as um, 1973 when Section 504 of the Rehab Act was created. Um, there was a provision included against discrimination in our healthcare system um, that was intended to preclude those kinds of metrics from becoming barriers to care. The Americans with Disabilities Act was then passed in 1990, again, extending discrimination protections to programs and services offered by state and local governments. And then soon after the passage of the ADA, this issue came up very concretely when um, Oregon submitted a waiver to um, the secretary, which would have used the quality adjusted life year as the basis to determine their prioritized list of services. The secretary responded to that, rejected it, and said, no, you can't use qualies because to do so would discriminate in terms of what you would or would not cover and how people access care. More recently, we've seen the National Council on Disability come out with a report that recommended enforcement against the quali, um, basing that position on Section 504, 1557, um, they even went so far as to say that they would oppose importing the use of qualies by referencing foreign prices. Um, and you will also notice too, if you go to their website, that they have explicitly come out in opposition to the president's executive order that would import um, prices, foreign drug prices into Medicare. Their rationale being in other countries, there is discrimination using this metric to ration care, and therefore we don't wanna import that discrimination to the United States. Additionally, there's a long history. Um, if you look at the opposition to quality adjusted life years coming out of this year, coming out of the DNC platform, um, we were really excited to see the DNC platform, I have to say, because it explicitly says that Democrats will ensure that people with disabilities are not denied coverage based on the use of quality adjusted life year indexes. Um, there is also a long history here. Um, Medicare for America, Medicare for all both in include um, some form of a ban on the use of the quality adjusted life year. Um, and we also saw in the COVID-19 discrimination debate that Senator Warren and other Democratic senators sent a letter to the Office for Civil Rights that included reference to qualies as an example of historic discrimination in the United States. Um, and then and back in 2010, interestingly enough, um, it was actually a Republican-led effort to include the quality ban in the, in the PCORI statute. So there's a lot of bipartisan support for this issue. Um, 
and so I, I always like to point out that it, it is not actually a partisan issue, it is a bipartisan one. So how could policymakers use qualities and why do you think you need to, why do we think you need to worry about it? Um, there are two ways that policymakers have um, proposed to use the quality. One is in reference to cost effectiveness or value in coverage reimbursement and utilization management. This was the issue that we were attempting to address in the Medicare, in the, in the PCORI statute, which would which banned the use of qualities in the Medicare program. The challenge is that private payers continue to use quality-based assessments, particularly by groups like the Institute for Clinical and Economic Review um, and, and, and their benefit design through their p and committees, their pharmaceutical and therapeutic committees. Um, you know, we have, always opposed using those, referencing these types of quality-based value assessments in public programs. Um, we don't wanna replicate that kind of, those kinds of barriers in public programs. And then the other way that policymakers can use qualities is in reference to foreign prices, um, which is often referred to as the most favored nation or international reference pricing rubric um, that would import qualities from other countries. So we had drafted a paper that, um, and I want to thank the sickle cell community because I think really what we learned through the sickle cell process when, when ICER, the Institute for Clinical Economic Review, was doing a value assessment based on qualities of sickle cell disease, we realized that not only was this metric a problem for people with disabilities, but it was exacerbated for communities of color that are even more underrepresented in the literature that then feeds the value assessment. Um, if you look at clinical, clinical trials data, they lack minority participants and their models just do not capture data applicable um, to communities of color. They're much more um, based on ma white male non-Hispanic populations. Um, and the other issue that often comes up is that quality-based models emit attention to the evidence that differential triggers like pollution and food insecurity have on the expression of disease and illness. Um, we know that communities of color often receive lower quality care um, less care, um, and that has an impact on their on their on the, how their diseases present. So, so I use this as an example. I know we're going to talk a lot about sickle cell today. So I wanted to talk a little bit about cardiovascular disease. Um, ICER has looked at cardiovascular disease and cholesterol several times. Um, if we base our assessment of care and treatments for cardiovascular disease and high cholesterol on averages though, as ICER does in their model, we worry that we will continue to exacerbate instead of lower pervasive health inequities in our country. Um, if you actually look specifically at the 2019 cardiovascular disease assessment, the calculator of risk reflected less than 10% people of color, yet the CDC tells us that non-Hispanic black persons were more than twice as likely as others to die of heart disease. Um, and so even when ICER found cost effectiveness with those treatments, I think what's interesting is that in their policy recommendations, they still recommended to insurers that they use restrictive policies on their planned formularies, such as prior auth and step therapy. Um, and so now they're looking again at, at cholesterol lowering treatments we know that ethnicity is a risk enhancing factor under new cholesterol guidelines. Um, and yet we also know that when they looked at PCSK9s a few years ago, even though prices have come down, insurers are still implementing very tight utilization management practices in large part because of the recommendations of ICER. So this is just my way of, of kind of providing a level set. I know that the rest of the panelists are gonna be able to to give you much more specific examples of their experiences working with ICER and working through this metric. Um, but I guess I would argue that we really want to avoid using a metric in our policies that exacerbates as opposed to helps with health inequities in this country. And I'll turn it over now to Alexis. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. I am um, really pleased to be a part of this panel. I can't thank uh, Tasha and NMQF enough for the invitation to participate. Just trying to get the slides to advance. There we go. 
So I'm actually, since we're, we're framing this on sickle cell, and my apologies to those in the audience that are steeped in sickle cell disease. Some of us live and breathe this every day. And so, um, so this, some of this may be quite basic, but just to make sure that we're all on the same page. So I, uh, what is sickle cell disease? It's an inherited blood disorder. It affects the red blood cells, which typically are those cells in our bloodstream that are important for carrying oxygen to all of our tissues. Individuals with sickle cell disease can only make an abnormal hemoglobin, and that hemoglobin affects not only the shape of the cells, but the ability for those cells to carry oxygen. This is uh, not terribly important for, for the purposes of this audience, but this is the basic pathophysiology. This is a genetic disorder that's caused by a very dis discrete mutation in our genes that fundamentally changes the behavior of hemoglobin inside of red blood cells that makes those red cell sh sh shapes change under certain conditions and cause obstruction of blood vessels and a number of the manifestations of this disease. And the manifestations of sickle cell disease on the next slide are many. Um, how common is sickle cell? About 100,000 Americans have it. That's really an estimate. One in 12 African Americans has trait. One in every 375 African American babies born in the United States has sickle cell disease. I think one other very important observation is that now one out of every 10 newborns in the United States with sickle cell disease is Hispanic. Sickle cell disease for being a fairly simple uh, um, uh, genetic mutation has an, um, an amazing array of uh, clinical complications that are both acute and chronic and essentially affect almost every single organ in the body. Over time, we've made progress. So since the very first um, description of sickle cell disease in the literature that occurred over 100 years ago, for the longest time, there was very little progress. And in the early 70s, the National Sickle Cell Control Act was passed, which led to the creation of the comprehensive sickle cell centers, which were often uh, critical places for the expansion of research initiatives in sickle cell disease. Um, and as a consequence, led to a much steeper improvement in, in, um, in uh, life expectancy related to not only the identification of children through newborn screening, but also the evidence base um, of the intervention of simply using penicillin after diagnosis to prevent infections. Some of these efforts also led to the introduction of hydroxyurea, another medication that's associated with the reduction of pain episodes and the extension of life in sickle cell disease. We've also learned that a simple ultrasound test done annually for children coupled with transfusions are able to prevent devastating complications such as strokes. And so while all of this um, is, is, is well, uh, fine and well in terms of looking at sickle cell disease itself, it's really very important to look at where we have been as a country and looking at all Americans. And so over the last century, while we certainly have seen these uh, incremental and now more rapid improvements in sickle cell, it's important to point out though that the improved life expectancy in sickle cell disease continues to lag behind the overall US population by nearly three decades. And so when we talk about where we need to go and when we talk about um, uh, the health disparities, it's really, we, we can certainly laud some of our improvements, but we clearly have quite a ways to go to truly see health equity in this population. I think it's also worth pointing out in a, in a different way, our progress. So if I'm looking at, for instance, where we were in, uh, before 1980, and this was before newborn screen was widespread, we can point to a peak that was in the early childhood years. So before the age of five, when there were substantial numbers of deaths in small children. 
over time, we began instituting a number of changes um, and um, were able to see really a, a complete elimination of that early peak in deaths in children. And we've seen the curve extend outward. Yet even as, as recently as three years ago, we continue to see the peak deaths are at a time when most of us would think people are most vibrant and most productive. With uh, sometime Between the ages of 20 and 45, we continue to see these as areas where there is substantial um, uh, uh, rates of death in patients with sickle cell disease. So again, areas of disparities and opportunities for improvement. Let's go on to the next slide. Um, one very key document that's come out just recently um, that I, I um, that I that really was just um, uh, released last month is a new blueprint for action for sickle cell disease. That's a report that had been commissioned by the Department of Health and Human Services and the Office of Minority Health entitled Addressing Sickle Cell Disease, a Strategic Plan and a Blueprint for Action. It's, this is a fairly dense volume, but, but well worth the read in terms of looking for uh, what this, this outstanding group of, um, of stakeholders um, are providing for us. There are a couple of the pillars, though, that I want to point out that are particularly relevant uh, to this conversation. One is that one of the, in order to truly uh, address sickle cell disease, we need to strengthen the evidence base for interventions and disease management and to implement widespread efforts to monitor the quality of care for sickle cell. We also need to address the barriers for, uh, to access current and pipeline therapies for sickle cell disease. One key statement that was made by, by this group, um, go on the next slide, I think it's, it's worth noting that there was certainly one key statement and, and that was that uh, we, need to, we, need, by, we need to improve care, improve health outcomes for sickle cell care requires comprehensive team-based care new payment models, and addressing institutional racism in healthcare. I mentioned also needing to strengthen the evidence base for interventions. And one recent example of this is the clinical practice guidelines that have now been uh, completed and are now um, out uh, for, um, for use uh, by the American Society of Hematology. These are evidence-based guidelines that are targeting primarily healthcare providers, but also clearly the ultimate beneficiaries we hope are patients and caregivers. These guidelines include um, addressing evidence-based care recommendations for sickle cell pain, transfusion support, cardiopulmonary and kidney disease, cerebral vascular or brain injuries in sickle cell and stem cell transplant, all of which are, are now things that are out in the public domain and that need to be considered for, um, for really improving care and looking at standards of care for sickle cell disease. On the next slide, the, the, our, our plans now are about implementation. The number of tools have been developed and can be used by medical educators, by physicians in practice, um, and also tools for individuals who are hospital-based physicians and emergency medicine physicians. We know that emergency care is, is fraught with issues with sickle cell, but giving providers in the emergency room better access to tools to help them provide superior care or high quality care to, pay, to uh, patients with sickle cell. We also want to continue to empower the patient community by creating patient education materials uh, using lay language in collaboration with organizations like the Centers for Disease Control, um, providing stakeholder webinars, creating patient decision aids, any methods that we can to be sure that we can actually empower this community um, and to educate uh, healthcare providers. Things like this these practice guidelines also provide materials for advocacy and the American Society of Hematology and others continue to advocate on Capitol Hill and also state houses on what should be the standards of care for sickle cell that are evidence-based. So on this next slide, um, these are a number of the treatment options. I've described some of them. Certainly penicillin, pain medications, hydration and hydroxyurea are very well established ways to help control this disease. Stem cell transplantation using a matched sibling donor as the, the, the donor for uh, stem cells is now established and can be curative. 
transfusions have also been ameliorative, ameliorative in sickle cell disease. But I think what is most noteworthy and, uh, are these new disease modifying therapies um, that are now coming onto the market, as well as new potential curative disease therapies such as gene therapy and gene editing. Um, and so as these two options are coming online, again, looking at the, the, the full arc of this particular presentation, wanting to be sure that we are very thoughtful. And so on my final slide, the question that I pose, and it relates to Sarah's uh, comments, as well as the next two presentations. On my next slide, um, the question that we need to ask is who determines Trying to get the next slide to come up. Sorry, Alexis, that was your last slide in, in my version. <laughs> ah, the next slide, the final slide really is who and what determines the value of sickle cell therapies? How much is a sickle cell life worth? Um, we know that patients, providers, industry payers, and for that matter, society, all may have a role in making these kinds of decisions. But these, these various stakeholders may have uh, colliding uh, values and they may reflect cultural and differences among these different groups. And so collectively, um, we need to be able to balance what is the answer for what, is, for what do these different stakeholders contribute, um, but ultimately, how do we value the life of someone with sickle cell disease? So with that, I will thank you. And I, I hope uh, that Irene and uh, Dr. Bailey will continue to, uh, to frame this, th this conversation. Thank you. Irene? You should have control of the slides now. Thank you, uh, Alexis. Good morning, everyone. Um, and thank you to Latasha and the NMQF for inviting me to participate in this important discussion. Let's see. Trying to advance the slides, but it doesn't. Seem I think to... maybe Sarah still has control because I'm only manually able to release. Okay. So I think um, Alexis left off with an important question in terms of how do we determine value for therapies in sickle cell disease? And also spoke to the fact that there's new disease modifying therapies. And so how do we? assess value for those therapies of applying traditional frameworks. I think that's a, a important uh, challenge. So here we talk about that sickle cell disease is an area of high unmet need. This is a unique disease uh, that affects primarily minority populations. And this has historically been an overlooked, underserved and underrepresented population. Alexa spoke to the fact that sickle cell disease can affect almost every organ. And many patients suffer from multi-organ damage, which is the primary primary cause of death. And as well, uh, all these complications in sickle cell disease lead to decreased quality of life. <clears throat> Complicating this further is the lack of access to quality healthcare services. And we know that there is a, a dearth of um, practicing physicians that have expertise in sickle cell, uh, especially in the adult population, which leads to issues when patients transition from pediatric to adult care. And so overall, improving um, access to quality care is important for this population. Uh, importantly, when we, when we look at resource use in uh, sickle cell disease, we understand that the healthcare co costs currently are quite significant. So if we evaluate the lifetime healthcare expenses for one individual patient, one study shows that that's approximately $9 million over a person's lifetime. And then in aggregate, when we look at um, the annual cost of spending in the US for individuals with sickle cell disease, that aggregate cost is over 1 billion. So thinking about where are the resources currently going uh, for sickle cell that's really on um, treatment as it relates to ER visits, as it relates to hospitalizations, but it's quite a significant amount of dollars being spent with um, really not uh, adequate outcomes. And so how do we improve, I think, how we're spending these resources resources and improve overall uh, outcomes for this population. Um, importantly, the, the burden is, is far beyond just healthcare, healthcare uh, resources and extends to um, other 
parts of the SDG community. So first, when we talk about annual healthcare costs and you look at um, an individual patient with complications, uh, that individual can have healthcare costs uh, close to $300,000 a year. Um, additionally, if you think about someone who's trying to, to work and the amount of time they spend trying to access healthcare, that can be a one to two months uh, a year, really just spent uh, receiving services. Um, there's a study recently published that looks at the overall impact on lifetime income for patients with sickle cell. And when you think about the, the fact that these patients unfortunately have um, two to three decades less uh, life as compared to the normal population, that results in an estimated $700,000 in lost lifetime income. And the impacts for this population extend far beyond the individual patient, but when we also think about the caregivers um, impacted, the overall productivity loss in um, aggregate is substantial. Um, so what is needed is certainly additional um, research and funding to help improve outcomes. And when we look at this one example, um, we see that there's disparity when you compare um, a disease like sickle cell to that um, of cystic fibrosis and sickle cell disease, as Alexis mentioned, affects approximately 100,000 patients in the United States, while cystic fibrosis affects approximately 30,000 patients and um, very different populations. But when you look at the overall funding, whether it's um, NIH funding, so government dollars or private funding from foundations, you can see that the overall annual um, spend is approximately 10 times more for cystic fibrosis than sickle cell disease. So clearly um, a huge disparity there and, and something that needs additional um, investment. And when you look at the overall um, lack of investment that's led to essentially less therapies being available for patients over time. So this slide shows looking at orphan diseases in general, um, what is the number of therapies that have been developed year over year for orphan diseases? And specifically looking at sickle cell disease, you can see that there was one therapy approved in 1998, that was hydroxyurea. And then for 20 years, there were no additional therapies approved until L-glutamine was approved in 2017. And then subsequent to that, there were two um, additional therapies that were approved uh, late last year in November. That was crizinolizumab and Voxelator. So while I think the, the most recent um, approval of additional therapies is certainly encouraging, I think this slide highlights the fact that there are still a paucity of therapies in um, sickle cell disease available. And certainly we need to encourage more investment uh, in this area. So thinking about that and then going back to what Sarah spoke to, when we talk about current value frameworks, given um, all the complexity of the diseases and the unique aspects of sickle cell disease, uh, the current value frameworks are inadequate to properly assess new treatments. Um, if you want to assess value in this particular area, we have to make sure that the value frameworks that we're using are appropriate and that we're uh, accounting for all of the relevant um, components of value to a variety of stakeholders. And there are a lot of different things when we look at value from a societal perspective that need to be included. Things like e equity value are not traditionally included in value assessments, but that incorporates the ability of treatments in an area like sickle cell disease to improve overall population equity. And we know that there's substantial health inequities when we think about this population. Other things like the value of hope. Um, so again, I think a lot of um, relevant elements of value that aren't currently included in traditional value assessments. Um, as existing value frameworks apply to the current evidence base will underestimate new treatments. So there are therapies that have been improved under accelerated approval from the FDA. And accelerated approval essentially means that um, the endpoints being used, the FDA agrees that these are reasonably likely to predict clinical benefit. And so when we look at all of the epidemiologic evidence to date um, applied to an endpoint like hemoglobin and hemolysis, um, we understand that there's potential um, for treating that endpoint to really have an impact on um, morbidity and mortality. And then lastly, when we think about value frameworks, we, we, we want to make sure that they incorporate um, the broad range of stakeholder feedbacks to have a truly inclusive process. So if we're asking you know, patients and, and caregivers what's important to them, it's, it's um, necessary that we not only ask these questions, but we make sure that these things get incorporated into value assessments. And I think this goes back to the question that Alexis raised and sort of who determines what, um, what is valuable for a particular patient.
sorry. And so, and finally, um, I think in aggregate, uh, we believe that value assessments in sickle cell disease at this time are premature. Uh, given the high and unmet need that's been spoken to, we are spending um, a, a large amount of um, healthcare dollars really for not ideal uh, for outcomes that aren't ideal. So we're spending, as I mentioned, over a billion dollars a year for sickle cell disease, but not getting optimal outcomes. And we need to have the ability um, to assess whether these new therapies can make a difference and bend that curve. And so in this intermediate time, it's really unnecessary to, to conduct value assessments in sickle cell disease. Patients overall are more likely to be harmed by these assessments if they inaccurately characterize the value of novel therapies. Um, additionally, we need time to aggregate real world data to inform how new therapies are um, impacting patients. And there's initiatives um, by various, I think, organizations, including the American Society of Hematology to collect longitudinal disease data to inform the patient course and to assess how you know, these therapies are impacting complications and morbidities, et cetera. But um, in, the, in advance of all that, I think it's sort of premature to have these value assessments and the detrimental impact is um, inappropriate assessments could have a negative impact on access to therapies. And so if um, payers or other organizations are, are using sort of inadequate value assessments to determine whether or not patients get access to, access to therapies, that certainly presents a problem and we don't um, want to negatively impact access. So with that, I will turn it over to uh, Lakia to talk more about this from the patient perspective. Thank you. Verify. There we are. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm delighted to come in wrapping this up here. Um, because I think it's important to, to put the patient face to this discussion, because that is essentially who and what we are talking about. And all of this in the discussion of ICERS, we are talking about the value of therapies. We're talking about the value of me. I am Dr. Lakia Bailey. I'm the executive director of the Sickle Cell Consortium, founder and one of the founders and executive director I have degrees in biochemistry and molecular biology, uh, doctors in molecular hematology and regenerative medicine. Essentially, I am a colossal nerd in so many ways. I love anime and comic books and have always, always, always wanted to go to space. Since that'll probably never happen, it's a really good chance that I can still maybe get an opportunity to learn how to fly a plane. I am also in the midst of all of that an adult living with sickle cell disease. I, I was not Irene, diagnosed. Irene, if you could release control and then um, Lakia will be able to advance her slides. Sorry. I did, I did. I don't have control. Hmm, neither do I. Okay, well, I'll advance for you. Just give me a cue. Okay, go ahead. I was not diagnosed at birth. I am in that age group born and I'm 42. I was born in the late 70s. And so my parents did not know that they both carried the trait. And so I, my diagnosis was a surprise to them. In fact, uh, the being diagnosed at birth was not a thing yet across the board for all states. It does exist now. So those younger than me, hopefully and ideally do know. I did not. Next. In fact, I was not uh, diagnosed until I began having problems at age three. At age three years old, I was having, my mother says, constant stomach aches. And she said I was too young to be in that much pain all the time. She took me to multiple doctors and my mother was actually accused of having Munchausen syndrome. The doctors thought that she was doing something to harm me. And Finally, she found a very talented physician who had recently graduated medical school. We're very grateful to Dr. Simpson and had reset up his practice in Gary, Indiana. He had come back to Gary, Indiana, of all places, to set up his practice. And he recognized those symptoms. And that was our really our first battle with access to care and getting a diagnosis. I began having sickling crises and events at age five. My mother took me in for that very first hand foot syndrome and the 
it was the um, the doctor told her you will um, told her that I needed to go into the hospital when I was diagnosed previous slide still but when I was diagnosed I did not um, she was told that I would never be sick I'd probably never go into crisis that it'd be fine so by the time I turned seven over well, five and then seven you can go to the next slide I had begun getting sick she took me into that very first crisis and that very first hospitalization and they said I needed to be admitted and she thought they were joking because she'd been told I'd never be ill now we have so much more information about sickle cell and we know that that is really not the case our battle my battle with access to care with treatments and therapies begin began right here Fortunately, by the time I turned seven, we had moved again, and we found this fantastic physician, Dr. Talukian. Talukian and her husband were both physicians, and she was willing to contact Dr. Simpson and learn anything she needed to learn. I was actually on um, regular blood transfusions long before the study even came out showing that it could decrease stroke. I had I was incredibly fortunate and incredibly blessed to be able to have access and have a doctor that was willing to do strange things and ask strange questions. And I was very blessed. From here on out, however, in and out of hospitals, all the way through high school, next slide, and all the way to this point in my life, we were in and out of hospitals. We were in and out of treatments and therapies. I had moved to Georgia and met the fantastic Dr. Iris Buchanan, who was able to begin to interact with us and teach us the things that we needed to know about sickle cell disease. It is, however, here that we began to realize that there was nothing. There was nothing. As was mentioned a moment ago, hydroxyurea came about in the 1985, 86, and so we began that whole process of looking for treatments, of looking for drugs, of looking for access, 98 actually. And by the time I graduated high school in 96, there was still nothing. We lived, we were at blood transfusions, IVs, and we died in excruciating amount of pain. And then in 98, hydroxyurea came about as the first FDA approved. And I'd like us to take a moment to remember, those of you that may know and those of you that do not, sickle cell disease was identified over 100 years ago. It is the first disease to have its molecular basis known. Sickle cell disease is the foundation for major, major scientific achievements, including a Nobel Prize. In chemistry, it is sickle cell disease that enables us to do a lot of the treatments and therapies. PCR, if you've ever been in a research lab, PCR came about because of our understanding of sickle cell disease. If you've ever wondered how we know and how we're able to do so much diagnosis in utero, sickle cell disease and the knowledge that we have for that, you can look all of these things up. The research that came about came about from sickle cell disease, but a treatment for us did not. I've heard other patients say that we are asked to be a part of everyone's research study, but no one wants to treat our disease. And in 1998, we got our first option, hydroxyurea. It would be another decade before anything else came. A decade of in and out of hospitals. A decade of not everyone responding to hydroxyurea. Hydrea, I may make some physicians upset, some hematologists, Although it goes against what we are often told, it is not the cochlear implant of sickle cell disease. It is not the cure-all. It does not work for everyone. I am not a responder. I still take it because fingers crossed, but I am not a responder to hydroxyurea. And then it would be a full decade. It would be a decade of trying to get through graduate of, 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 of college. It'd be a decade of working my way through this, and finally, next slide, finishing college. And this one actually took me five years, not the typical four, in and out of hospitalizations. This was the best photo that I could find surrounded by family and my church family here. And this process was so much harder than it had to be. 
but it is the reality of those of us living with this disease, seeking care and finding very little, very few who will offer us treatment and care, very few hematologists are willing to treat sickle cell disease, very few that know much of anything, including, although it's gotten better now, but at this point, this woman didn't have a doctor telling her about hydroxyurea. Next slide, please. I put this photo in here because at this point, I had gotten into graduate school. I am laying in this hospital bed surrounded by notebooks. There's actually two computers up in this photo. The nurses that would see me outside, I ran into a nurse outside of the hospital, sort of like running into your teacher when you're no longer in school in the grocery store. No clue who she was. But she said, you're the one always surrounded by all the books. And then I recognized, oh, she must be one of my nurses. Because this is the reality for so many of us. I'd like to take a moment to just mention that in sickle cell disease, we are all things that all people are. Amongst our community, you will find doctors and lawyers, you will find research scientists and teachers, a race car driver and a bodybuilder. I know people that do all things. And laying in this hospital bed, hydroxyurea was still the only FDA approved. It took another 10 years until L-glutamine in 2017. Next slide. And by that point, I had completed graduate school and had become Dr. Lakia Bailey. A very, very proud moment for me and my family. This woman and so many like her in this moment still only had hydroxyurea. When we talk about the value, when we are talking about the, 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 it started with what are you worth? And when we started having this conversation, when you're discussing the value of therapy, we are discussing how much is this woman worth and how much are those just like her? Next slide. At some point, I met the phenomenal Tosinola. Tosinola is the individual who coined the phrase Sickle Cell Warriors, Inc. If you check the Google Analytics, it was not in use prior to Tosin. Tosin started Sickle Cell Warriors, Inc., and I came on board as her vice president and director of research. Uh, young, very new to advocacy, fresh with a, a PhD, patting myself on the back. All right, let's do this. And we still had only hydroxyurea. Next slide. Together, we became the superheroes. This is a photo at ASH, and we became the superheroes of hematology, me and Tosin, and so many just like us. In the sickle cell community, the majority of people running community-based organizations and these nonprofits have sickle cell or are raising a child with sickle cell. And soon I was able to be one of the founders of the Sickle Cell Community Consortium. And we began this process of being a champion. One of our meetings, um, 2017 rolled around and we invited out in Aeneas who met with patients and caregivers directly because we finally in a decade, we doubled the number of treatments of FDA approved to a whopping total of two. Next slide, please. And we continued. We continued to push through, most of us continuing, and we lost so many. We lost so many champions and advocates along the way. And finally, 2019 came around. And in this one miraculous year, last year, may I point out, we doubled it again in over 100 years, in 110 years to a total number of four FDA-approved therapies. This next slide. But this gets us into the value of what we are worth. It was November of 2019 that these two treatments came in to play. And then it was January that ICER, the Institute of Clinical and Economic Review, put out their first report. Now, there's so much that we can say about this. 
and I'm going to go there. Any scientist worth their salt knows you do not form a conclusion of a study before you have the data. It had been two months, and the report was put out. Now, I am the patient that's living with sickle cell disease. I am the one that is all here dying and trying very hard to live with my community. And so I feel like that gives me maybe just a little bit of leeway to say the things that perhaps have not been said. I, sir, in their attempt to define the value of my life, put out a report undervaluing just that in two months. In this month of time, I, we went from having these amazing treatments and just full disclosure, I am on all four because I want to live and so many like me do. I don't know how many people will be put in a position of being asked to define the value of their life. What are you worth? There has been an attempt with these qualities, which has already been pointed out, have major bipartisan opposition and has been outruled. You cannot use qualities in Medicaid and Medicare. You cannot use them for so many because, and I'm going to be very, very transparent here, they are at their heart discriminatory. And where we are with this, when we are asked what is the value of your worth, we have, it is too soon. It is too soon. Therapeutic interventions should not be based on effectiveness, but it is entirely too soon to have the data to determine the effectiveness of these therapies. Was excited to partner with several other organizations, as you can see here, and we began this process of understanding. In the sickle cell community, there was a great deal of confusion. There was this false sense of urgency. Can you go to the next slide, please? And it became apparent that we needed to define qualities and then ICER, what ICER is, and more specifically, what it is not. This is not a federal government agency. They are not affiliated with the FDA, does not have the authority to approve or deny drug access. Yet our community, and so when all of this came out, I took it upon myself, I felt like I needed a better understanding. And I reached out to other organizations and other disease groups who were battling, and, and I will say battling ICER. And so we found ourselves in this position of needing to understand what was going on. And what I learned was that, ICER had a tendency of uniting and unifying with a particular, with one group to the exclusion and isolation of others, and then putting together these documents and claiming to have reached out to the sickle cell community and utilize what was learned there. ICERs held their meeting with the sickle cell patient involvement in Boston in March, which to me identifies and sort of demonstrates a lack of understanding for this disease patient group in general. Next slide. And so we put together documents. We worked together to find, and you can find these things and value our health. Next slide, please. Um, you can find a lot of these things at valueourhealth.org forward slash sickle cell disease to learn more and more about this. I'm going fast because I'm out of time, but I wanted to just point out that we have been asked to define the value of our life, but what we are doing is asked to define the value and the value of hope, the hope for these new treatments and drugs, the hope for the value and the worth of who I am and what I am. And the development of these resources came at just the right time so that this community could understand and truly put together and understand what was being asked of us, who we are, and how to define those things. I am a patient. I am living with sickle cell disease. I have fought and done great things, and so have so many of us. And in defining the value of my life, and defining the value of hope and what that hope is worth, we have been fully undervalued. I'm excited to be able to work with this group here for us to be able to show, pull the cover off and recognize and have transparent discussions about qualities, about ICER and the value of who we are, what we're worth 
and what we have the potential of creating and being in the sickle cell community and in the world in general. Thank you. I am pulling this slide up absolutely last because that little dot up there is me parasailing. And the one next to it is me jumping out of a plane. Last slide. We are all things that all people are. We are capable of absolute insanity. The first picture me rethinking, am I really about to jump out of this plane? And that second picture, yep, yeah, I am jumping out of this plane. I'm going to live big and be who I am capable of being. And all we are asking is for the opportunity for all of us to do the same. Thank you so much, Lakia. I know we are out of time and we won't have much time for questions and discussions. So maybe we can take this conversation to Twitter. I put our um, uh, handles here on um, this slide. I know that our, um, our organizers will post a, a paper um, that uh, Lakia and Sarah both referenced that PIPC and um, uh, the NMQF uh, um, wrote and it was endorsed by organizations like Lakia's and others. Um, but with that, I just want to allow you all to just share one word um, uh, about sickle cell and hope and what this really means for the community, for us to truly value your lives. What is that one word? I'll start with you, Lakia. For me, it, it means just that. It means life. Life. Alexis? Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> Urgency. The time is Urgency. Next. Thank you. Sarah? You know, I, I come back a lot to, it's not one word, but the, the disability mantra, which is nothing about us without us. Um, mm. It really comes down to making sure that you're at the table for decisions that impact your lives. And then Irene. Yeah, sorry, I don't have one word, but I guess I would say things that are important include um, innovation and addressing uh, health inequality and health inequity. I think that's very important and very relevant, especially this year. Great. And I know we have a video that um, Brandon and uh, the NMQF team will share. So with that, we'll go to the video. I want to take the time to thank DBT, our corporate sponsors of our roundtable, and all of those who support the National Minority Quality Forum. I thank you all for your time and attention today. Our next session will start at 1115, and that's the cancer care in the community. And the link is in the chat feature. We actually didn't have any questions um, from our audience. That means everyone covered everything successfully. Um, and hopefully they'll follow us all on Twitter. So with that, thank you all. And thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you. Thank you thank so much. You. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. Are we done?